Sinister alien force is mutilating America's livestock. The sex organs have been removed from the animals and all without blood. The UFO special, next. Welcome to Sightings. I'm Tim White. Tonight, UFO experts who conduct serious research have a whole vocabulary to describe their formative science. One term you may not be familiar with is flap. A flap occurs when UFOs appear in waves over a specific area for a specific period of time. The appearance of flaps has sinister overtones for ufologists who believe these recurring sightings have a secret and perhaps deadly agenda. All around the globe, there are certain places that seem to act as natural UFO magnets. These areas are attracting flaps, or waves of UFOs, that may last for years. There are hotspots in Russia, Europe, and in South America, the heavily populated city of Sao Paulo has had hundreds of sightings by thousands of people. These flaps have prompted researchers to try to find a common pattern or motive. Anybody who studies this soon becomes almost desperate to understand a pattern or to f impose some purpose on the phenomenon. In the United States, sightings are widespread and occur almost nightly. America's number one hotspot is Gulf Breeze, Florida. Ralph Fuller's sighting in 1988 was among thousands of others, but Ralph was the first to capture a UFO on tape. I don't know what that is out there over the Gulf, but we just just had a uh, real bright light. I think it might be a flying saucer. They seem to spawn one another. Uh, the the two went to three and four, and uh, ultimately, uh, over a matter of maybe a couple of minutes' time, uh, there were ten of these uh, lights out over the Gulf and uh, they seem to be in some semblance of a formation, but still in all, there was no movement whatsoever, no noise, no sound, nothing of that sort. You see nothing but the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the nearest point of land would be the Yucatan Peninsula, and there were no boats or anything of that uh, type in the area either. These are sky watchers, amateur UFO enthusiasts in the Gulf Breeze area who go out almost every night of the week with cameras and binoculars in search of UFOs. What makes a good sky watching area for one is a good field of view, that is uh, being able to have an unobstructed view of the skyline and, and ideally you'd like to be away from city lights but that's not always possible. So we go out in the evening uh, and take our chances and you may have a relaxing evening uh, out under the stars, and, and then you may be blessed with uh, a sighting. We just never know. We've seen uh, amber-colored lights, eight lights in a perfect circle gliding and, and performing maneuvers in the sky. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, rows of lights uh, suggesting lights uh, perhaps around uh, the periphery of a craft. There are UFO hotspots all over the country, Gulf Breeze certainly, but also here in New York State near a little town called Pine Bush. And the hotspots here near Pine Bush, according to one scientist, have a very special meaning. Bruce Cornett is a geologist who lives near Pine Bush, New York. After numerous significant sightings of UFOs near his home, he began studying the area with an electromagnetometer. What I found is that these magnetic anomalies are in specific patterns. And all of the UFO activity, the landings, the sightings where they are taking off and landing, when we've been able to uh, identify specific areas, are associated with these magnetic anomalies. Are you suggesting that uh, nature created homing devices deep in the ground? No, I think that it's a reverse. 
if we are dealing with an alien uh, culture and they are doing something underground, they're using the natural magnetic anomalies to disguise their own magnetic signals. Are you saying there are or could be aliens in the Earth? I'm not saying it's certain. It is definitely possible based on what I've seen. Do you realize how that sounds? I don't like the idea just simply because it is so outrageous. Then I would have to also add some of the photographic data that I have that shows, at least in one particular case, a UFO going up at a seven degree dive right down into the ground, what appears to be. Ellen Crystal has been investigating the pine bush flap since the early 1980s. In her book, Silent Invasion, she documents hundreds of UFO encounters in the area. Working independently, her findings seem to coincide with those of Bruce Cornett. These ships kept coming back to the same fields, night after night after night, the same places in the woods. Also, we had experiences where we clearly heard somebody drilling in the woods at night, and this is private property. It seems that there's something being constructed underground, such as an artificial installation of some type. One of the most well-documented sightings in history occurred in Pine Bush on August 6th, 1992. We think in excess of a thousand people may have seen two, three ships or four ships where I took video. And all the police departments across the whole uh, lower New York State area were simply inundated with just hundreds and hundreds of calls. We looked over top of the trees and there was this object there out of nowhere great big option. It was about 300 foot wide, the size of a football field hanging over your head, and about 300 foot off the ground. We looked at our clocks, and we had three battery running clocks, two in the kitchen and one in the living room. And for some strange reason, all three clocks were stopped at the same time. Just about everyone in Pine Bush has seen a UFO. In his barber shop, Butch Hunt hears a lot of stories from eyewitnesses about strange alien encounters. About 60% of the people around here, I, I think, have seen something. And some talk about it and some don't. They're just afraid to talk about it. Afraid of ridicule and intimidation. The one that we saw was over at Red Mills Bridge. And there were six of us in the car. And it just so, so nice, it just glided right over the trees. And we just got out and stood there. And just gawked at it and nobody said a word. But the whole episode was probably 30 seconds. But it was huge. It was bigger than the bridge. UFOs are sighted by all kinds of people, including uh, the most credible professionals that you can find. In addition, when we have multiple witnesses we can, who all tell the same story, uh, then we can say, well, that's probably a pretty good report. If we have enough detail in a given report that we can rule out all of the uh, normal explanations. It's not the planet Venus, it's not the Aurora Borealis or a meteor, it's not an aircraft that we can name. Uh, then we are talking something very incredible. No one disputes that there have been unidentified flying objects sighted around the world. Where ufologists and skeptics differ is in how they interpret these sightings. Some skeptics believe that all UFOs are really conventional aircraft, while others see a deliberate hoax. But just how common are UFO hoaxes, and how do the experts weed them out? Each year, there are more than 10,000 UFO sightings reported in the United States alone. Many of those sightings are documented on film or videotape. But how many of these sightings are genuine, unidentified, and unexplainable flying objects? Sightings has received hundreds of photographs, films and tapes of supposed UFOs. The experts we use to analyze these reports are very careful in determining what they consider to be credible. UFO photographs that are hoaxed are hard to do. When there are hoaxes, we can find them. With the use of sophisticated equipment, expert UFO analysts try to methodically separate fact from fantasy. Genuine UFO from obvious hoax. There's some basic techniques that are used to hoax UFO pictures. Overlays, pace up, small models, 
optical technology, electronic technology. In fact, the library is full of techniques on special effects. Many videotaped images appear genuine, but careful analysis and scrutiny often prove otherwise. This tape received by sightings was analyzed by Dilatoso. This is a good example of a very well done, well executed hoax of a UFO. You'll notice here on the edges that the edge here, this edge, this one, this one, are all the same number of pixels. When they are very similar, as they are in this picture, it indicates that it's a small object close to the camera. Point of the story, this is a model. First of all, they're all potential hoaxes to begin with. So if the picture looks too good, it probably was staged. Now that cameras are in the hands of the general public and most everyone has one, we are finding that there is an increase in the availability of videos of UFOs. You can't just say, oh, this is a hoax. As a scientist, it's your obligation to finish the question and the answer. If it is a hoax, how did they do it? When I first got into this, I used to think that there was considerable hoaxing. But over the years, I've discovered that uh, there's a whole lot less hoaxing than we assumed and that the situation is probably reversed. Maybe 20% are deliberate hoaxes perpetrated by somebody for some purpose of his own and maybe 30% are misperceptions and the rest seem to be real unknowns to me. We have to thank the people that do hoaxes because they help us understand the other side too and what purposes there may be in real UFOs coming here. It's a tremendous mystery we're trying to solve. Despite careful analysis and overwhelming evidence, there are some people who refuse to believe in the existence of any space encounters. Case in point, there are still people who are dedicated to proving that Neil Armstrong's moon landing in 1969 was a hoax, staged, they say, by Hollywood. Coming up, what sinister alien force is mutilating America's livestock? The sex organs have been removed from the animals, and all without blood. Our exclusive UFO report continues next. UFOs, reports of abduction, and close encounters are not the only potential evidence of alien visitation. Ufologists believe the Nazca lines of Peru and crop circles are also forms of UFO communication. Now, after more than 20 years of study, some experts believe further proof of extraterrestrials on Earth can be found in the bizarre deaths of cattle. The cut on her jaw bone was just real, real sharp, precise cut. A large incision, removing its uh, sex organs, rectum had been cored out, tail cut off. Her milk sack had been cut out on the left side in an oval about the size of a basketball. It's a mystery that remains unexplained after 30 years of investigation. Some claim alien forces are responsible. Others claim cult activity or secret government testing, cattle mutilation. The most recent outbreak appears to have been in a three-county area of northeastern Alabama. Over 50 cases of mutilation have been reported in just the past six months. Organs appear to have been removed with surgical precision. So far, the farmers in the area have lost more than $40,000 in livestock. With such tremendous losses, the police department in Fife, Alabama has launched an intensive investigation. Ted Oliphant is a Fife police officer who has personally investigated more than 30 cattle mutilation cases. We're finding the same thing over and over again. The sex organs have been removed from the animals. The tongues have been cut out of them. The jaw has been stripped into oval, clean to the bone, and all without blood. Who or what is responsible for the seemingly ritualistic slaughter of these cattle? Researchers have little to go on beyond these decomposing carcasses. And despite attempts to prove that a sinister force is at work here, some experts believe the mutilations are all the result of natural causes. It leads us to think maybe that animal is getting mutilated, but what's happening is predators, vultures, are also involved with that process. The indication that the predators are not responsible for these animals being cut on is the evidence of high heat at the excision, 
evidence of high heat in excess of several hundred degrees or more, according to the pathologist who studied the tissue samples. That pathologist is Dr. John Altshuler. He has studied suspect cattle tissue for the last four years. The tissue at the incisional areas is very firm and very hard and looks burned. And the microscopic evidence clearly indicates that heat has been applied. And predators, to my knowledge, cannot do that. Here we have a photomicrograph taken of the hide from an animal where we've had evidence of burning. The arrow shows a pink color to the tissue underneath the lining of the hide. As we move towards the cut area, you notice a definite color change from pink down here to blue up here. This is a very typical change of exposure of tissue to heat. Other unusual evidence has been found at some alleged mutilation sites. A white flaky substance was recovered from one Alabama location. Officer Oliphant had it analyzed at one Eastern University. And they determined that it was composed of aluminum, titanium, silicon, and oxygen. Aluminum and oxygen, or aluminum oxide, is what's used in the styptic pencil that I use if I've cut myself after shaving, and that stops bleeding. Perhaps that has something to do with why the animals don't have blood on them at the excision lines. In more than half of the Alabama cases, farmers report seeing an unmarked helicopter leaving the scene just before or after a cattle mutilation. They had a chopper in behind my barn. Had all my cattle rounded up in behind the barn. The chopper, when it appeared, uh, uh, it was kind of unordinary. It looked like it's sitting on a box, you know. Of course, it was big enough to get a cow in, you know. If they catch them hovering over their cattle and pasture, I'd probably shoot him. Probably shoot him. Loud helicopter noise. Sound like it's right over the trailer. Went out the front door. Went over to my car. Returned the seat. Pulled out a handgun. I walked towards the edge of the trailer. I saw the helicopter. It's a light blue helicopter, no markings, no numbers, and it was hovering about 15 foot above the tree. I dropped my holster, and the helicopter veered off. I think the greatest mystery of this case is the lack of physical evidence that we found at the sites. Only in one case did we find that white flaky material. We haven't been able to find footprints, we haven't been able to find tracks or wheel marks or anything to indicate that anybody's even been in there. How do you explain that? We can't. My tendency to believe is that something of a lot higher intelligence than what we've got in normal everyday occurrence around here. Don't really have any ideas who could be doing it or the reasons behind it, you know. You could get most of the parts they removed from a slaughterhouse for free, you know. Yes, sir, I run a meat processing plant, and uh, I made a statement that I would donate them uh, jawbone, uh, their blood, uh, their rectum, and whatever, you know, if they just uh, asked me for it, and then uh, they wouldn't have to kill these farmers' cattle like they do. Despite the willingness of the ranchers to cooperate with authorities in a larger scale investigation, most government officials are sticking to the predator theory. They do not believe that high tension lines in the area are somehow related to the mutilations. They also deny charges that the government is mutilating cattle in order to support new technology, replacing human blood with bovine blood. And what about the unmarked helicopters? Do they point to the existence of a conspiracy? I think the helicopters are doing the same thing we're doing on the ground. I think they're investigating who's doing this. They're trying to find out, too. And because of their behavior, it's obvious that they'd rather have us think that they're doing it than what's actually happening. Whoever or whatever is responsible may never be known. The silent testimony of these mutilation victims has not been able to resolve the mystery. One of the most intriguing aspects of our investigation is what we didn't find. The moment our sightings team arrived in Fife, the mutilation stopped. Did our presence scare someone or something away? Or was it merely coincidence that our investigation coincided with an end to this bizarre phenomenon? Coming up, can life exist in outer space? A bizarre growth discovered on a satellite brought back from space has scientists baffled. In some cases, it looks somewhat like a fungus or a mold.
satellites have brought back priceless data from outer space. Recently, one NASA satellite was retrieved after being lost in space for six years. That satellite brought back something scientists have never seen before, and so far, can't explain. Scientists are puzzled by the unidentified space growth and excited at the prospect of what may be a new life form recovered from the exterior of a satellite. The growth is a very interesting phenomenon. It's not exactly identified yet, but it's still in preliminary stages at this point. The growth appeared on an LDEF, the abbreviation for Long Duration Exposure Facility, basically a satellite designed to expose and test materials in outer space. It is a gradient growth that generates from an area in which the covered portion of the LDEF was located at. And as you can see specifically right in this area, you get a very silvery looking area to a very dark brown into a brownish white kind of area. In that area, scientists found microscopic fibers. When they were magnified by a high powered scanning microscope, mysterious images were revealed. In some cases, it looks somewhat like either like a fungus or a mold, at least to some of us. What came back on this satellite appears to be organic, but some researchers believe the growth is merely the result of a battery leak on board the craft. Others point to the fibers as proof that the growth is organic and that strange new life forms may exist in outer space. If you've had a paranormal experience, call the Sightings Hotline at 1-900-273-8255.